or a very popular icon like Mary Monroe, or Mao Tung, or Walt Disney, or anything that has become a part of the popular visual culture. So, a quick glance at all these images look pretty much like any commercial advertisements or publicity images that we come across every day. So, if you are not familiar with pop art, in the first glance, these images may look like, they may not look like at all that we are looking at some examples from the domain of art history. They look like commercial images. But as a matter of fact, they are all remarkable examples of fine art from the history of art. Obviously, the borderline has become extremely thin and it has been deliberately done. To the extent that in many examples of pop art, the borderline between art and commercial image does not exist at all. Pop artists used common images from everyday culture as their source base, including advertisements, that is publicity images, consumer goods, celebrities or images of celebrities like Marilyn Monroe, Mouse of Tung, or any other pop icon, then photographs, that is mass photographs, photographing mass circulation, and of course comic strips. Pop artists were inspired by billboards, huge billboards, which was a part of a new consumer visual culture of America since 1940s. Public murals, magazine images, newspaper photographs. In fact, when you compare these images with the photographs of various parts of America in 1960s and 70s and 80s, with many pop art images, you hardly find any difference. And this is exactly what they intended to do, so that we don't get any differences, so that we don't make the typical highbrow kind of discrimination between this is commercial art and that is fine art. Some of the most famous pop artists are Jasper Jones, Roy Lichtenstein, Andy Warhol, Robert Rauschenberg, Blaise Oldenburg, amongst many others. To put it simply, the pop art movement wanted to bring art back into the daily life of people by using the images from the daily life of people. It was a reaction against abstract painting, which pop artists considered as too sophisticated, too elite, and too philosophical for the common people to comprehend. Pop artists Favorite images were objects from everyday life, like soup cans for Andy Warhol, or comics for Roy Lichtenstein. Typical for the attitude of the pop art movement was Andy Warhol's use of calligraphy, a photorealistic mass production technique of print making. Pop art included into the media and advertising. The differences between the fine arts and commercial arts were voluntarily torn down. So these are some of the features that we see happening during this movement of pop art. So what looks like a cinema poster or a publicity image is actually a work of art by Andy Warhol, like this one. Now, along with the fact that he was using silk screen reproduction method, which was a typically a commercial printing method, but he brought that into the domain of fine art. Along with the fact that Andy Warhol was repainting the most popular and iconic images of American visual culture at that point of time, and in this case it is Melvin, uh, 
then in Monroe space. Along with these two things, there is a third aspect that is uh, noticeable in his works and many others works also. That many pop artists were also using this idea of multiplicity. This is very interesting because multiplicity or multiple reproductions of the same image, same photograph, several times, hundreds and thousands of times, and circulated in our visual culture creates a huge impact. Of course, it has a commercial purpose. It has a market-driven idea why it is to be done. But the fact that the pop artists are using this idea of multiplicity has a great impact on the whole idea of art because uh, generally speaking, mainstream history of art has always relied on the uniqueness of a work of art, of a image. But here, somebody like Andy Warhol breaks down the myth of uniqueness, creates multiplicity, but not exactly that the same face or the same image gets multiplied or reproduced several times. He has also shown, like in this painting, that every time he reproduces the image of the same face of the same person, the reproduced image is not exactly the same. So he introduces a wonderful paradox here that multiplicity claims similar images. It claims that it is possible to reproduce similar images exactly the same kind in the same way again and again, as many times you want. But the paradox is, because of the very technology and because of the way the technology is being used by Andy Warhol, it is possible that Whereas on the surface, superficially, it appears to be multiplicity of the same kind. At the back of the idea is also variations. So when you look at each of these nine faces of Marilyn Monroe of this work of art, we find none of them is actually same with the other. They are all different. So, very subtly, Andy Warhol introduces the paradox of multiplicity. In that sense, he is really speaking not going by the consumerist publicity image culture, but somewhere he is leaving a comment. He's leaving a statement. He's making his own observation. A few more words by him like this image of Mao Zedong or Walt Disney, a photograph of a display of Andy Warhol's works. And in the behind, you can see, once again, nine same images of Mao Zedong's portrait, but each of them is slightly different because of the color and because of the technology that the serigraphy used in slightly different way every time. So, multiplicity itself is being questioned by using multiplicity as a possibility. This is where the paradox lies. But sometimes, like this image of Campbell's soap, Andy Warhol, doesn't really change the character of the image every time. He leaves them as it is and makes a statement by almost saying that this is how the uniqueness of an image is completely destroyed in a market-driven consumerist culture. Then we have Roy Lichtenstein, who has been using images from everyday comic strips and simply blowing them up in a big scale. 
and slightly manipulating somewhere, some images or maybe the bit of text. But because of this focus on certain details from a large comic strip which we read every day and blowing it up almost out of proportion on a huge scale of canvas, there is a change in the meaning. Not meaning of the content of the comic strip, but there is a change in the impact of the image on us. Because we are used to see comic strip in very small scale printed on our daily newspaper. We are not used to see them in a huge size big canvas. However, familiar we are with those images. That is beside the point. But we don't see them in that way. So, I think they were playing a trick. On the one hand, people like Andy Warhol, Roy Lichtenstein, or Jasper Jones are using very, very commonplace motifs like American flag, or Mouthstone, Men in Monroe, comic strips, but simply by repainting it on a huge scale, they are creating a different impact. They are playing with our familiarity, but at the same time, defamiliarizing the experience that we have when we read the same comic strip on the newspaper. This is by this Jones again, a different painting based on the idea of a bullseye, which is very common as a motif. There are several such artists, like Jasper Jones and Rauschenberg, and of course we have seen Andy Warhol and Roy Lichtenstein. But particularly with Rauschenberg, we have seen an increasing use of collage. As a technique. Collage has already been used very effectively by the Cubist painters like Picasso and Brack. Collage has been used by the Dadaist artists. But collage is being used by the pop artists from an entirely different perspective. Because for them, collage is a way to reclaim what is popular and bring them into the popular domain of art, forgetting the discrimination between fine art and commercial art. And at the same time, by virtue of using collage, you can also give up the authorship. That you do not have any signature style of painting because you are all using already reproduced images as a part of your collage competition. So this kind of attitude on part of the artists, pop artists themselves became like Andy Warhol, an iconic figure, a cult figure, let us say, during his own time. So his sayings become very proverbial, like the one that has been quoted here, when he says that art is what you can get away with. In other words, Andy Warhol was somebody who was trying to, let us say, trivialize art on the one hand, and on the other hand, he was also questioning and challenging the bloated idea of fine art and its claims. So that is why all his sayings. Like in the future, everybody will be world famous in 15 minutes or for 15 minutes. These kind of proverbial sayings and quotations made him even more famous because these quotations were, in a sense, a kind of blasphemy, sacrilegious, challenging, and of course radical in the given context. Now, Pop art aims to employ images of popular as opposed to the elitist culture in art. And this confrontation between the elite art and the popular art gets reflected in many of these sayings and quotations by Andy Warhol. 
Popot emphasized the banal, complicated elements of any Vedic culture, most often through the use of irony. It is also associated with the artist's use of mechanical means of reproduction or rendering techniques, like we have already mentioned about calligraphy. And Popper certainly challenged tradition or a long kind of uh, European tradition of art and its norms and conventions by asserting that an artist's use of the mass produced visual commodities of popular culture is contiguous with the perspective of fine art. They don't have anything in conflict. That is what they wanted to assert. A few more paintings by Rauschenberg, where he is using collages, he is using photographs, he is using different techniques of painting on the same canvas and thereby bypassing any singular stylistic feature in his works. We have already seen this by him. And then we have one unique artist belonging to the pop art movement. And the name of the artist is Claes Oldenburg, who made wonderful public sculptures, open air sculptures, or even small sculptures. But interestingly, as you see in this picture, the sculptures made by Oldenburg do not have anything very imaginative in the sense that directly and very realistically, more often than not, represent something that is very banal, very common, very ordinary, like a safety pin, or like a toilet commode, or like an eaten apple, or a cuttercock, or a huge clip. Now, once again, there is this scale and the size that plays a very important role in creating a visual impact. Something that you see every day, as common as a septic pin, or a shutter cock, or a wooden clothes clip. And then when you see these objects again, blown up, magnified in a huge scale and kept in a public space, they stored in a public space, claimed as a statue or a sculpture that certainly creates a different impact. So scale is a very important role here, very important feature. If they had made the same objects like this tray on the spoon, and it is called spoon bridge in the cherry. In a small scale, close to the real scale of the objects, probably that wouldn't have created much impact. At least we wouldn't have anything more to say other than appreciating skill involved in creating an imitation of a commonplace object. But when you amplify the scale, when you magnify the size of a very common object into a giant scale, into a giant image, into a giant structure and shape, that is what, that is something that reflects the popular American culture. Because the popular American culture always wanted to reach the big, the bigger, the biggest. So even a very, very common place object like a shutter cock or a half eaten apple, when amplified or magnified into a huge scale, that somewhere gratifies the American aspiration. To, be, to become very big, the superpower of the world. 
Popper, in that sense, was successful in addressing this particular sentiment, this popular sentiment that was gradually gripping the imagination of American people to become the superpower of the world, to dominate the world, to become the global hero. And pop art like this one, an ice cream, ice cream cone recreated in a massive size, in a huge scale, and installed on top of a building, definitely was not only creating a very popular visual impact on the passerby or in the environment, but in a sense, pop art, whether it is a sculpture by Ken Goldenberg or paintings and calligraphies by Andy Warhol, Roy Lichtenstein, Jasper Jones, Rothenberg, it could be anybody's work. They all, in a sense, embody the aspirations of American popular dream. So on the one hand, Pop Art was successfully incorporating the elements of the mass culture, and on the other hand, it was successfully manifesting and expressing and giving shape, a tangible visual shape to the common popular American dream. Mm -hmm.